would you rate Moldova's financial system? Stable, capable to finance what it needs to finance, well supervised. How is the capital market performing? It is underdeveloped. We will look into it even f- further in the future, together with uh, the other donors. What uh, export capacity does the country have uh, to the EU? The country has the export capacity to the EU. Why does the National Bank of Moldova need independence? If you want to con- have higher welfare of citizens, meaning with higher growth, with better employment, you need to have stable inflation. And this is done if you have an independent central bank. What can Moldova uh, do to attract uh, the foreign uh, investments? Moldova is a very well place. It's close to the EU. But in order to fully benefit from that, we need to ensure that there are certain reforms in the business environment. Think positively. I think uh, better times are coming. Inflationary slowdown is the good news of the year, and uh, the bad news is the recession facing uh, major uh, economies. How are things looking in Moldova? Uh, Does the country's uh, macroeconomic situation uh, leave you optimistic? First of all, thank you very much for starting on a positive note. And this is this uh, issue of inflation, which we did. We are observing it slowing down across the EU and across the Eurozone. Of course, what needs to be said is that uh, the numbers look somewhat different for different EU member states, depending on the national economic context. For example, in Croatia, the inflation is a bit higher than in Belgium, which is on account of good touristic season, which uh, created additional demand. So by itself, it's uh, not such a bad thing. When it comes to the economic growth, we are waiting with interest for the EU forecast, which is going to be uh, published soon. But what uh, is indicated now in the forecast that we have available, for example, IMF's one, it is the fact that uh, likely the Eurozone will manage to avoid the recession in 2023. This is good news. Of course, we are hoping that uh, in 2024 we will be able to reach a higher level of growth and that when it comes to inflation, we are going to come to the levels around 2%, which is according to the ECB's expectations. Now, when we look at Moldova, we also hope that uh, the growth in 2023 will be positive. We expect the growth to strengthen even further in 2024. And uh, we expect that the inflation will come back to the single digit numbers in 2023. And then in 2024, of course, be around uh, the target from the National Bank of Moldova. Now, what is very important to say is that this is short term projections, but uh, in a more long term, The ability of the country to grow faster, and this country needs to grow faster if it wants to catch up, if it wants to converge towards the EU level, this growth rate will very much depend on the ability of the country to do a long-standing structural reforms, which of course us from the EU will be here to support. Look, uh, last year's uh, biggest issue was the uh, um, food price crisis and uh, the cost of energy, uh, both of which uh, were uh, linked to the war. What does the outlook uh, for 2023 uh, uh, look like? Uh, What are the fears, uh, the uncertainties? Indeed, Moldova was faced uh, in the last two years with uh, several crises. We didn't only talk about the energy crisis, but we had the war in the neighboring Ukraine. We had the refugee crisis, uh, cost of living rising for the citizens. However, I believe that uh, going forward, and this is how we see it uh, from the EU side, um, we believe the outlook to be uh, positive. This is also confirmed by the recent Moody's report, who even though it uh, repeated the rating for Moldova, it decreased the outlook to positive. Now, the important thing to emphasize is that for the external elements that influence your economy, uh, well, they're external, so by default, uh, they don't depend on you. Of course, you need to prepare for them. And uh, I think this is where we are in Moldova, that the country is much better prepared Uh, for the winter, for the autumn season, for example, when it comes to energy supply, uh, the energy supply has been diversified. Moldova has a stable macroeconomic context. So we believe that it's coming and it's going towards the winter uh, much better prepared in the previous years. And we also believe that the context, uh, even though global context is challenging, became slightly more positive for the country because it became a candidate for the EU membership. And this is something that Moody also highlights, Moody's also highlights uh, in order to increase the outlook. 
So overall, I know that usually the economists uh, predict nine out of five crises. This is the usual joke. But uh, I think that for sure this year we can be more optimistic when it comes to outlook. During the overlapping crisis, European funding was a helping hand. Uh, how would uh, you define the um, role of this help? Thank you very much for this question. I have to be very clear on this uh, as a new staff here on the ground. I think that uh, the EU support was very much instrumental, but uh, equally important, it was very timely to support the Moldovan citizens, to support Moldovan businesses, to support the refugees and all the other purposes that it was disbursed for. Um, I have to say this because we at the EU delegation, me, my colleagues, my hierarchy, but also my colleagues in Brussels, uh, we worked around the clock to be able to disburse the money as quickly as possible in order to provide the support when it was needed the most. Uh, when it comes to the funding, so far we have disbursed more than 1 billion euros. This is a, a very big amount. Um, and there are certain disbursements that are um, even yet to happen. They are coming in the future. In addition to that, there is, or we have, economic and investment plan, uh, which is which offers additional possibility to leverage 1.6 billion of investments in the country. Now, very often when we talk about the EU support, we look at it from the financial aspects. We look at the financial numbers. But there is another aspect that probably needs to be looked at. Um, if you took, for example, a stadium here, a Dynamo Stadium in, um, in Kishnau, and if you filled it with all the experts, all the advisors we had, all the high-level advisors, all the expats that work in the country in order to provide the support, I think the stadium would be quite full. And I think this amount of knowledge, this amount of expertise that is there shows how much we are committed to help the government, to help the citizens to develop further and to ensure better well-being for, for the citizens in the country. You are seeing an uh, improvement in uh, economic activity uh, compared to previous years. Uh, the National Bank uh, of Moldova has also suggested people uh, consume more. Investors uh, should also uh, experience a renewed uh, sense of uh, confidence. Uh, does this uh, signify a uh, return to customary uh, state of affairs? You know, when the COVID start, uh, crisis started, uh, everybody started talking about this new normal. We were in this new normal uh, situation. I'm not sure if you have received a memo or an email that this new normal ended and that we came back to it. Uh, it's true that the world has changed uh, very much in the last two years. We have had uh, the pandemic, then we have had uh, the war, which we, I'm sure none of us could have imagined uh, several years ago, another uh, war in Europe. But there are certain changes in external environment that uh, are not necessarily bad. For example, for Moldova, what really changed in the last two years, it is the fact that now the country is the candidate for the EU membership. And this is one of the changes in the external environment which will define the country going forward. It will also define the, uh, its economic situation. So um, speaking about that, some changes, of course, remain, uh, both on the side of creating risks but some of the changes in the external environment are there and they are positive to the country. Now, maybe another important thing to mention is that we have seen two years of um, acute crisis. We have had the situation where we had to do firefighting measures, but now it seems with a positive outlook that we have discussed uh, before, it seems that slowly we will be able to come back to the situation where we can plan more long-term reforms when we can focus on the implementation, implementation of these long-term reforms. Uh, I think that kind of approach is uh, something that we can and we should call a customary state of approach, where we really help the country come closer to the EU standards uh, going forward. Next uh, question uh, is about the uh, banking system and the uh, economy, the relationship of uh, a bank and the uh, economy. A well-capitalized uh, banking system is a, a shock absorber and in challenging uh, circumstances, shock absorbers are necessary. Uh, however, how could business success to finance be increased? Uh, this is a very good question and it's a very important question. It is this access to finance by businesses is uh, an important aspect of uh, business environment. 
uh, that we recognize uh, in the EU as uh, very important. We are aware of the fact that uh, the banking system is well capitalized in the country. And very often we are faced with the question, but how come then this banking system does not offer uh, credits, offer loans to, uh, to, to the businesses? Well, I think we should look at this aspect from two perspectives. One perspective is the one of the bank. Uh, we, you probably, we keep our savings, we keep our income in the bank account under the belief that they will uh, use it wisely, that they will use it prudently. So we wouldn't want the bank to extend the loan to, for example, a company that doesn't have a viable or well-elaborated business plan. So I think what we should think of in the future is how to work with businesses in order to help them create bankable projects, in order to help them draft a business plan, come up with idea that then the financial system, which is liquid and has funds, can support. Now, there is another aspect. And that aspect comes from the fact that indeed with an increase um, in business activities, we will need to look for new instruments, new abilities to finance micro companies, to finance uh, businesses that have new innovative ideas, because it's true that for a regular financial system, those are maybe too risky to take, uh, to, to take on board. We have also recognized this as the EU. We have interfered in the market in a way that we have provided a grant to your entrepreneurship development organization, ODA. Concretely, the grant is of 8 million euros that then ODA can extend further as grants to the companies. But we believe that more should be done. And the good news is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know which instruments work well in some other countries. And I think Moldova should use these experiences from other countries and just apply them here. Whether this means in the way how we do the grants to the company, whether it is in some kind of blended financing, whether it is in guarantee or some similar approaches. Competition for investment is now frequently discussed. What can Moldova do to attract the foreign investments? Competition for investment as a topic gained traction at the outset of COVID pandemic in Europe. Uh, and the reason was quite simple. Uh, we saw for quite a few decades before that, the European companies bringing production outside of Europe, sometimes very, very far. Uh, and not only the production, but also some services either linked to production or not even necessarily. Now, with the outbreak of COVID pandemic, what became apparent is that such business model also has certain risks attached to it. Uh, we have seen the value chains that suddenly didn't function that well. Uh, we have seen that it was difficult to uh, transfer certain goods back to Europe. And what appeared in that period was this idea of nearshoring, nearshoring as opposed to offshoring, um, which basically means the company is bringing production closer to Europe. Now, Moldova is a very well place to benefit from such a process. First of all, because it's close to the EU, it's, uh, it has a border with the EU, it speaks the same language as one of the big EU member states. But in order to fully benefit from that, we need to ensure that there are certain reforms in the business environment, that the business environment is conducive for these companies to place there. There is another process from which Moldova can benefit when it comes to bringing investors. Uh, and that process is probably going to be one of the biggest exercises in the, in, for Europe in uh, this century. And that process, which will hopefully start soon, is the reconstruction of Ukraine. Now, when the infrastructure, uh, reconstruction of Ukraine starts, Moldova, because of its geographical proximity, can serve as a hub for companies that then do certain business and certain activities in uh, Ukraine. I would here like to add one more point. And that point is that what we globally observe is the fact that countries that attract investments also in uh, infrastructure, private investment in infrastructure, have had higher levels of growth. Now, Moldova has had certain experience with this kind of investments. For example, Giurgiulesti port is one of those. But more should be done in order to be able to have this private capital in the infrastructure. Which uh, sectors uh, should investment come to first? Uh, is uh, there more interest in the European market for investments in Moldova? What uh, measure uh, 
uh, would help uh, to stimulate this interest? Moldova is a small country. So a very important thing to have in mind uh, for such a structure of economy is the need to prioritize and think strategically. Moldova is not China, so it cannot develop all the sectors at the same time. So it's very important to choose. Now, what your government has done in your development strategy, and we believe it's very good, it is that it prioritizes certain sectors. We believe they are well chosen and that they reflect uh, certain comparative advantages Moldova has. Those sectors are, for example, agriculture. Those sectors are, for example, ICT. Uh, those sectors are certain technological development sectors. Now, it's very important to also have in mind that when we talk about the sector, it's, it's needed to invest further efforts into moving up the value chain in those sectors. Now, this is maybe a fancy way of saying that you should produce more complicated products and add more value to compared to what you're currently doing. So producing agricultural produce is excellent. You produce excellent agricultural produce and we all benefit from it because we eat great food. But if you use this agricultural produce to pre produce, for example, cosmetics or to produce gem instead of just producing some fruit, then you can sell it globally uh, for a higher price. And I believe this is the, the, the good approach that Moldova should take in order to attract the investors in those sectors which are higher up in the value chain, because this will help you with export and then in the end transferring more benefits to the citizens. What can you say about the efficient of public spending? When uh, you have an uh, inefficient public uh, sector uh, that uh, lives in a deficit and uh, therefore needs to be continually supplied with money to survive, it uh, is more difficult to curb inflation through monetary measures alone. Do you see effort in Chisinau uh, to implement uh, sensitive fiscal measures? I think your question has two parts. One being on uh, fiscal uh, spending, which is, of course, linked to public sector, and the other one a bit more on, on the public sector. Now, I will try to answer them separately. First, on public sector. Moldova is an European type uh, of an economy. And uh, in Europe, we really believe that public sector should have a significant role. This we observe across Europe, across the EU, that public sector is the one who generally provides health services, who generally provides transportation, who generally provides uh, education, but also the one who provides a rule of law and also the one who provides uh, good judiciary services, etc., etc. So public sector will remain crucial and important also for the private sector. You cannot have a functioning private sector without very well functioning uh, public sector. Now, of course, public sector needs to be efficient. The global research has shown that the countries that have more efficient public sector perform better. And this is exactly enshrined in the EU enlargement policy as well, because one of our priority is public administration reform. And going forward, because Moldova is now a candidate country, we are going to monitor very closely what happens in the public sector. And we are going to, of course, try to help the country modernize its public sector for the benefits of citizens, but also, let's say, for the benefit of businesses. Now, the second part of your question, which is, of course, linked, it's related to public spending. In fact, Moldova has been quite prudent with public spending. If we see that the debt to GDP ratio of Moldova is around 38 percent, maybe a bit lower, this is relatively low even compared to its peers, which shows the prudency of budgetary planning. But it also gives a good news, and that's the fact that even we had two very significant crises in the past two years, we have maintained the capacity of the country to even finance its future development with debt. And these are good news, because this can bring higher growth level in the future. But uh, there is a fiscal uh, rule in the EU whereby governments have uh, carb uh, their deficits. Should uh, the same uh, be done in Moldova? Let me answer you simply, yes. So fiscal rules are enshrined in the EU treaties. Uh, even the famous number that uh, majority of people know, and this is 60% of uh, debt to GDP ratio and 3% deficit as a, as a target. These are the numbers that are in the EU treaties. Now, 
in the process of gradual approximation towards the EU as a candidate country, Moldova should develop its le legislation that reflects those rules. Uh, Moldova, in fact, has certain fiscal rules already in place, but uh, going forward, we will work with the country in bringing them closer to, to, to the, the way they are defined in the EU. And in addition to fiscal rules, this will also include the Independent Fiscal Council. This maybe can be something which is done in a medium term. In a, it will take some time until uh, certain support is developed and until Moldova adapts. But there is also another aspect related to fiscal framework which should be considered immediately, and that's the efi efficient use of budgetary resources in Moldova. What we have observed in the past years is that Moldova under-executes on capital budgets, for example. Uh, now, why is that bad? Capital budget uh, basically means uh, investment in infrastructure. This is the roads, this is the hospitals, this is all of these things that Moldova needs in order to develop further. And under execution of this budget means that the amount which is planned in the budget and is, is higher than what is actually done in the end. And we see this as suboptimal. Uh, and precisely because of that, we actually have uh, a project, we have experts in the Ministry of Finance whose goal is to help the country plan, develop, and then implement public investment projects. And therefore, I believe that if you ask me this similar question, maybe a year from now, we will be in a very much different situation where we will actually be able to execute that uh, capital budget, which is planned also in, in your annual budget. Moldova is a candidate for EU membership and uh, everyone expects the situation regarding uh, access to EU funds uh, to change. Uh, are these uh, expectations uh, justified? We have had two overlapping or even maybe more overlapping crises in Moldova. Uh, what we have seen is that the EU has managed to provide a significant amount of timely support and that, more importantly, this support reached those that were in need at that moment the most. I have mentioned earlier that we have disbursed more than 1 billion euros um, up to now and that uh, in the coming period we are also envisaging disbursement under different instruments. Now, I think that by this we have shown that we are a reliable partner uh, for Moldova. And this will continue even now when Moldova is the candidate country. Now, very often we are asked, we in the EU delegation, whether Moldova will have access to different funds. Now, the name of the actual fund, in my opinion, does not matter. It doesn't matter whether you are accessing resources from the fund which is called Instrument for Pre-Accession Assistance or the one which is called Nodici, which is currently the case. What is important that that it is that these funds come on time and that they reach their goal. And the goal is the reforms and the support to citizens. And I think we have managed to do that and we will continue to do that. And uh, if uh, I uh, ask you, what would the formula for success look like? What you can say? Think strategically. That would be the first thing. You need to know where you want to be if you want to go there. Otherwise, whatever you decide is always good. So you need to know where you want to go. The second formula for success would be use the benefits of the EU enlargement process. Uh, and the third one would be focus on long-standing structural reforms. Some of them take time, but in the end, there are benefits to them. What uh, projects for the development of Moldova's uh, financial system are underway? Currently, we have a very successful twinning project active in the National Bank of Moldova. And now you're asking yourself, uh, what is the twinning? Well, the twinning is uh, an interesting uh, implementation modality that we have at our disposal. As the name say, says, you have an institution in Moldova, so a beneficiary, and then you have a twinning institution from the EU member state and the idea is that these institutions from the EU member state can transfer certain knowledge, expertise, practice. They can be here with the experts. They can help deliver certain outputs. Now, at the moment in Moldova, we have a, this kind of project active in the National Bank, where uh, National Bank of Romania, National Bank of Lithuania and National Bank of the, the Netherlands are helping NBM develop financial supervision system, risk management and corporate governance in the financial sector. 
At the same time, we have a project active in the Ministry of Finance. I have mentioned it earlier. That's a project which helps the country with uh, public investment planning and execution. And it also helps the country with development of the capital market through, develop through developing the market for government securities or actually the debt financing. Uh, we also have active support to uh, Court of Accounts. We have also through high level advisors projects, you know, high level advisors, it's the people, highly ranked people from the EU member states who come to Moldova and work with the institutions on a regular basis, being able to constantly provide support on certain topics. We have those high level advisors or we are in the process of recruiting them in public finance management, but also in financial services and in anti-money laundering. I would also like to say that what our experience shows with the project is that even though we have amazing experts, even though we have great expertise available, whether these projects will show up or whether they will um, finalize with a good outcome depends a lot on the beneficiaries. And I have to say that both Ministry of Finance and the National Bank have been very willing and have been very capable of taking the expertise that was provided by our project. And that makes me extremely proud and extremely happy because this is exactly the reason why we manage to develop and to come up with, uh, with certain important outcomes. For example, the project in the ministry in the National Bank has helped the country with the reforms in financial sector. You know that there is currently a reform where the supervision of financial sector came from NCFM, part of the supervision came from NCFM to NBM. Or, for example, it helped the country with uh, drafting uh, application for single euro payment area, which we expect that the country will submit uh, very soon. What other projects is the EU uh, considering? We try to develop our support in a way that uh, it kind of fits together so that it's complementary to the previous support and the current ongoing support. The context changed a bit in the fact that now being a candidate country, Moldova will participate in some new exercises, in some new processes. One of those processes is the process of coordination of the economic policies, which in the EU is called popularly European semester. Now, the candidate countries participate in a similar process in a bit light version, but we call this process economic reform program. And in the coming years, we are going to try to support the country in participation of in this program. We have talked earlier about the fiscal rules. We believe that uh, general approximation or slow approximation with the EU fiscal rules will be important and developing fiscal council. So we plan to uh, offer support there. We continue to offer support uh, with developing uh, uh, of the capital markets and with the court of accounts as well with their strategic framework. Usually when we talk about the support in financial sector, you know, we all focus on the areas on the field. But one thing which we have observed is very important uh, is also communication on the reforms and on what kind of support is there in this relatively technical area. This is very important because in order to have the citizens on board and also to have the institutions on board, you need to be able to explain to them what you are doing, why you are doing it and what are the benefits in the end. So our plan also when it comes to the financial sector is to focus a bit more on the communication activities just to be able to explain why certain reforms are important and what benefits they would further bring to the citizens. My ne next uh, question is about uh, the needs of a uh, uh, financial system. What does the financial system need uh, primary now? Financial systems, in regardless of what country we talk about, need stability and predictability. Uh, and I believe this is something that uh, financial system uh, uh, in Moldova now has. Uh, it is well supervised. We have just finished the reform of financial sector supervision, where it kind of now got united under the National Bank of Moldova. We believe that uh, NBM being a strong institution with uh, good professionals, they will be able to maintain the stability and the quality of, uh, of the supervision. Of course, should there be a need from the EU side, we are there to help. One of the things that going forward we should think about uh, further developing is the capital market, for example, as the main priority. What uh, problems does the country have to solve to access uh, funds for uh, rapid development? 
Your question kind of assumes that uh, Moldova has had problems in accessing funds for rapid development. And here I would disagree. I think Moldova and the recent, uh, recent uh, crisis have shown has had access to the funds for rapid development. Uh, and I believe not only that the donors were able to provide this support, but also your main aid coordinator, which is in the country, the Ministry of Finance, has done a great job in observing, absorbing uh, these funds. Now, I have mentioned earlier that uh, with the outlook being somewhat positive and with finishing of these firefighting measures that we have had before, going forward we will be more focusing on long-term reforms. And in order to be able to focus on these long-term reforms, what we need in the country is uh, a kind of a partner who can help us calibrate the support coming in the future. What does that actually mean? It means that uh, we need someone who we will be able to talk to and who will be able to tell us, yes, this support you are planning, it's a great idea. But we also need someone who will be able to tell us, yes, this support might be a great idea, but we would like to prioritize this. Or we first start with something else and then we continue with something else. Um, I believe that Ministry of Finance will be able to be such a partner because so far my experience has been good. Um, and again, we are here to help if, uh, if there is a need. Finally, we have uh, some uh, short questions uh, for you. Uh, you are ready? Are you ready? Ready, absolutely ready. Oh, okay. What does the EU stand for? Democracy, security, economy, or in another sequence? It stands for all of it and at the same time. You should picture it like legs of a chair. You cannot have a ch stable chair without one leg missing. And this is similar for a country. So you cannot have a functioning uh, judiciary system without economy to finance it. And at the same time, you cannot have a good business environment and thriving economy without the rule of law and good judiciary. We in the EU recognize this, and this is why exactly why we enshrined all of these principles in the enlargement process. You are aware that the enlargement process is based on three main pillars. First pillar building political criteria, which exactly involves the security, the judiciary, the rule of law, human rights, very important. The economic criteria and the third one, public administration reform, which is something we discussed before and we mentioned its importance for the country's development. What experience can Moldova learn from uh, past enlargement processes and the uh, current candidate countries? There is a lot of experience to learn. I myself come from the newest EU member state, so I witnessed this enlargement process from the time when Mo Croatia applied for membership to the time when Croatia joined. So there is no need to reinvent the wheel. But what there is a need is to adapt this wheel to uh, certain uh, requirements of Moldova. If there is one advice I would definitely give uh, to the country which starts with the enlargement process is to uh, communicate with citizens and with civil society along the way. This is very important not only because uh, you want the citizens to be involved in order to get support for the EU membership, but this is also important because these citizens are the future EU citizens and the EU is actually us. The EU even though it's perceived like this maybe as some institution sitting in Brussels, but the EU eats its citizens. So by involving those citizens in the process of European integration, you kind of build this idea that we are this organization. Are there immediate economic advantages of candidate status? So it is something that comes with EU membership. There are immediate benefits and there are continuous benefits that the country will have uh, from the candidate status. Uh, usually when we are asked this question, uh, people assume that there will be a certain number attached with the, with the candidate status. Uh, but this is not the case. It's not the case simply because the number or the financial support we have been giving to the country was coming to the country even before it became the candidate country. And this support will continue. Now, the immediate benefits we have, for example, seen in the increase in outlook by Moody's agency. Moody's, when they explain why they increase the outlook to positive, one of the main reasons they, they say is the Moldova obtaining the candidate country status. Now, why is that? Well, as a candidate country, you're expected to gradually approximate the EU legislation. 
And with all the approximation of this EU legislation, this will bring your country, but also the standards of doing business, it will bring uh, rule of law to a highest level. And this then transfers into hopefully higher investors' confidence, better doing business, more investments, more foreign investments, more SMEs active, better access to financing, etc. So this would be some immediate um, benefits that will, I, in my opinion and in my experience from previous enlargement, grow as the country comes closer to the EU. How would you rate uh, Moldova's uh, financial uh, system? Stable capable to finance uh, what it needs to finance, uh, well supervised with certain elements that need to be further developed, for example, capital market. What uh, export capacity does the country have uh, to the EU? The country has the export capacity to the EU. Uh, today we talk about more than 60% of Moldovan export going to the EU. Now. Uh, I have mentioned earlier when we talked a bit about the business environment that uh, the country needs to prioritize, and this is also the case here. Um, it's, it's good to think of the sectors which have a significant comparative advantage and uh, focus on developing those. And let's not forget services. Services are very important. If you look at ICT, for example, ICT in Moldova, to my knowledge, employs around 20,000 people, but it generates 5 per 5% of GDP. Uh, this is great potential that Moldova can use. How is the capital market uh, performing? It is underdeveloped. Um, there are certain institutions that are not active in Moldova. We don't have really private pension funds, mutual funds. There is only one uh, life insurance company there. Market capitalization is, uh, when we talk about shares, is quite low. Usual global practice is that when you start developing capital markets, you start with government securities. Now, the situation in Moldova is that a uh, primary market for government security exists. That means that the government issues certain uh, securities in order to, uh, to get financing. But what doesn't exist is the secondary market, at least it's not um, developed enough, where you can on sell those securities between the investors. We have recognized this as something that needs uh, improvement. And uh, even though we provide already certain support to developing uh, government securities market, uh, what we call debt financing, uh, we will look into it even f further in the future together with uh, the other donors. Why does the National Bank of Moldova need independence? I thank you for this question, because I think this is something that really needs, uh, needs nailing down, you know, every now and then, because it uh, reappears uh, in different shapes and forms. Uh, let me ask you, let me ask for you this from the perspective of a citizen. So, first of all, there is a big body of international research that says that uh, if you have stable prices and if you have low inflation uh, level, uh, the countries achieve higher level of growth and lower unemployment meaning that the welfare of the citizens in such a country would be higher. Now, any rational policymaker would ask themselves, fine, this is something I want to do, but how do I achieve it? Then you can focus on the second part of the international research, which says that if you have an independent central bank, but that means not only independent central bank in terms of regulation, but also independent central bank in practice, that those countries and that in such environments we have managed to, or they managed to maintain stable prices and lower inflation level. Now, if you combine those two, what you actually come to the conclusion is that if you want to have higher welfare of citizens, meaning with higher growth, with better employment, you need to have stable, uh, stable inflation. And this is done if you have an independent central bank. Three suggestions uh, for the economy. What uh, would they be? Think strategically, use the enlargement process, and focus on the reforms. And uh, for citizens? It's always more difficult to give uh, advice to citizens, but I would say invest in education of any sort. It doesn't matter if it's uh, a language or if it's piano. I think this enriches our lives and uh, in the end makes us well, more employable even in the job market. Uh, be brave to take risks. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, and the third one, think positively. I think uh, better times are coming. This uh, podcast is called uh, Give Sense uh, to Money. If I ask you what uh, giving sense to money uh, means to you, what would you say? Money for me has always been uh, more um, a means, not an end. 
not a goal. So for me, money gives me an opportunity to spend good quality time with my friends. It gives me an opportunity to spend good time with my family, um, travel and uh, learn new things. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.